welcome everyone. Uh, glad you have joined us for the April webinar. I know many of us are still a little groggy from Easter. It's a great weekend, I'm sure, at all of our churches, all of our, uh, for all of you that are serving, you've had a great Easter weekend. And now we get to dive back in uh, to talking about discovering your calling. So I want to encourage you. This is a point in the semester where uh, you can see the finish line, but you're not quite there yet. Uh, Pastor Mike, who is with us, he's done. He is an Iron Man. If if you don't, uh, if you did not know, just hang around him for five minutes, and he will he will let you know. But Pastor Mike, I think this point in the semester, it's like a, it's like you know you're you're at mile twenty of the marathon, so you know the end is near, but it's still so far away. And uh, so I think we're getting to that point in the semester where you can see it coming. You know, you don't have too much longer. Uh, yet there's still a lot of work to be done. So I encourage you to plug in, uh, to do your work, to, uh, to, to, keep, to keep, pursuing, uh, keep pursuing it with excellence. But uh, anyway, so as you guys are all getting logged on, I'll introduce our guest tonight, Pastor Mike Acosta. Uh, he is at Grace Church in... Um, uh, we are at the same church that I'm privileged to serve in. So, Pastor Mike, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then we'll dive into the, to the content at hand. Yeah, thanks, pa Pastor Landon. I appreciate it. As most of you know, Pastor Landon is the most humble man he knows. And, <laughs> um, and uh, being an ultra marathoner that he is, I know the <laughs> level of envy he has for us Ironman is, is top notch. So, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, Pastor Landon. Um, you know, I, I, I love Pastor Landon because he is, uh, he is incredibly intelligent, a fabulous communicator, and just an incredible man of God. So you guys have been blessed to be uh, under his leadership, his teaching, uh, to be involved in, in Destiny. Uh, Destiny is an organization I hold with very high esteem, very high regard. I think they're doing it right. I think, uh, I think you've chosen to be a part of a program that's not only going to further your ministry, uh, but really uh, do do more to complete you as a as a man or woman of God. So uh, I I was I jumped at the chance when uh, he made an opportunity available for me to uh, to share with you uh, today, or, or actually tomorrow for some of you who may be as far away as the Philippines or other areas. It's already Wednesday morning there, so uh, I honor your commitment um, for wanting it bad enough. I've I've heard it said that the passion is found in the pursuit. Uh, so the fact that you've gotten up, that you have. Uh, you know, washed your face and brushed your teeth and gotten online. I'm just giving you maybe more credit than you're due to assume you've done those things. But, uh, you know, and, and those of us here in America, we're winding down our day. And you've chosen to put a cap on your day by being a part of this uh, webinar. So um, thank you, Pastor Landon. Thank you to all of you who are joining in. I, I've had something on my heart recently that um, I think is really uh, important uh, as it relates to calling. I, I've been in ministry for over a quarter of a century, and I can't tell you how many times I've I've asked somebody about where they're serving. You know, hey, 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 where are you serving? Well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to reveal my calling. I'm I'm waiting for my calling, Pastor Mike. I'm just I'm waiting to 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 hear what the Lord says. And Bishop Franklin Jones, who is um, a great mentor, uh, who's who went to be with the Lord in October of 2007, he said this. He said. Um, Hey, you want to know what your calling is? Your calling is whatever needs to be done right now. And uh, that's, that, that, that kind of sets the stage for what I want to talk to you about. As we know, the Bible is not a chronological history of, of humanity and God. It's a book of moments. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an important way to, to view Scripture because not every moment of humanity is found in the Bible. I mean, it, it, you know, obviously, it, it'd be inexhaustible. So, um, what we find inside of the Bible are moments where God interacted with mankind, where God wrapped himself in flesh, walked with mankind, and ultimately uh, paid a sacrifice that we couldn't pay on our own. Uh, and so I want to delve into a scripture. It's going to be found in two chapters. It's uh, Mark chapter four and Mark chapter five. And, and I'm not going to go verse by verse I, I, because I want you to capture the moment. I want you to think about this moment. Um, and four and five, if you read them that way, you'll, you'll really get a sense of what happens. And there's four primary characters. So if you're taking a note, the four characters that I want to talk about, Jesus is not actually one of the key characters I want to talk about. There's four groups. There are the hearers, the doers, the afflicted, and the numb. Hearers, doers, afflicted, and numb. 
And I'll go into what that means, uh, and I'll be as succinct as I can, Pastor Landon. If you hear me wandering off, or it looks like I'm dragging on, man, just jump in and, and get me back on task. But in Mark chapter 4, we see Jesus is teaching, and he's, he's down by the Sea of Galilee. It's a big lake, big, it's, it, it's in this region, and he's, and he's teaching. And man, he was having success. People were coming, the way we count success. People are coming by the droves, tens of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people. We, we record a miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Man, Jesus never had a problem getting people to listen to him. He never had a problem getting people to hear him, even today. Uh, obviously, we as Christians, we value the word of the Lord and we hold it in very high esteem and a deep place in our heart. But, you know, so do Muslims. He's a great prophet in Islam. And, and Hindus love the teaching of Jesus. Um, and, and agnostics can understand and agree with the principles. They just struggle in assigning the God card. Uh, and and e even atheists have a very hard time disputing the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus have, have been relevant and applicable to people uh, from the time that they were first heard. Um, so, so that's one of the things that I think we all need to be aware of. It's not all that, maybe it's not all that big of a deal to draw a crowd with the teachings of Jesus. People have always been interested in the teachings of Jesus. So here's Jesus. He's down by the seashore and he's teaching. And he's teaching in a way they can understand. He's talking about parables related to farmers. This is a, a largely agrarian and fishing community. They would understand um, parables that have to do with how they are going to eat, um, how they're going to manage the, the land that's been given to them. Um, he talks about uh, a parable of the lamp and he's you know he's going through things and he's teaching in a way they can understand well the first thing I want to encourage you with if you're ever teaching a group of people listening for the word of God teach in a way they can understand it the hearers find something that's relevant to them find something that makes sense if you're teaching a, a, a high school boys basketball team versus teaching in a memory care facility well those are two vastly different audiences uh, the Apostle Paul was great in the sermon at the Areopagus when he's addressing the Stoics and the philosophers. And he says, I can tell you're a very religious people. I've seen the monuments to your gods. And he immediately begins presenting the gospel in a way they can understand it. And we see Jesus modeling this. He's talking to a group of farmers, fishermen, people from that area that would be very familiar with how he's addressing them. So hearers are gathering together and he's having a tremendous amount of success. Now, one of the things that's a little bit different about Jesus than maybe what we see from even Christian leaders today is the fact that that success wasn't enough to satisfy. It wasn't that he, he drew these big crowds and that was good enough. He's just going to stay right there. You know, how often would it be that if we're if we're having success at our church and every week, hundreds of people, thousands of people are coming more and more and they're bringing their friends. Man, we want to stay right there. But at the height of his popularity, Jesus in fact, so many people had come that, that, that he had had to get on a boat and he would go up and down the seashore and he would be teaching. And at the height of this popularity, he looks at the people who are closest to him. He looks at the doers. So you got the hearers that are coming to hear the word. They're coming in droves to hear the word. And then he looks at the doers. Now, the doers are the people that when Jesus is teaching, man, he needs to, uh, Jesus needs to He's not reaching everybody. Not everybody can hear his voice. So somebody had to say, hey, wait a minute. These folks over here aren't hearing. So let me get a boat. Somebody else went and got a boat and brought it to Jesus. And man, Jesus sounds like his throat's getting a little raspy. Somebody would have had to go get some water, or, you know, a snack, something to keep them going. If, they, if the breeze kicks up and it's kind of cool, someone's got to get a, a jacket for him. Somebody's got to be serving Jesus and serving the people. Those are the doers. So when Jesus says, hey, let's go to the other side, we need, we need to leave this crowd and we need to go to the other side of this lake. We've got to get to the other side. The Bible is very clear in Mark chapter 4. Towards the end of it, it says Jesus went just as he was. Which means Jesus is in a boat and says, hey guys, let's go to the other side. Jesus didn't get out of the boat to go get some food. Or to get any provisions for the trip. Jesus went just as he was. So somebody had to go get it. Somebody had to get other boats for the other disciples to go. Somebody had to get food for the journey. Somebody, somebody had to get what they would need to get to the other side. So those were the doers. They were, they were going in the direction Jesus told them to go when he told them to go there. As a doer, and that's what you are, that's what I am, we are doers. We need to listen for Jesus and go in the direction he tells us to go when he tells us to go there. Now, here's a really important point. As they, as they leave the crowds, as they leave 
um, the shore and they get out into the middle of, of the Sea of Galilee, a, a mighty storm rages up. Now, the, most of these young people grew up there in that region, in that area. They wouldn't be unfamiliar with the squall that happens out on the middle of the lake. They, that would be something normal to them. But sometimes you encounter a storm in your life as a doer that requires more of you than there is of you. Now, Jesus was with them. Remember, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus was with them, but he wasn't engaged in their storm. So these doers are taking Jesus where Jesus wants to go, when he tells them he wants to go. And while he is with them, a storm rages and, and, and they're concerned for their lives. They're fearing for their lives. And finally, somebody says, hey, wait a minute. We need to go engage Jesus in this storm. So they go and they get him and they engage Jesus in the storm. And he says, peace, be still. And he, and he calms the winds and the waves once he's engaged in the storm. So they, they make it to the other side, um, to the Gerizines, or depending on which gospel you're reading, um, the Gadarenes, uh, this region of Gadara. Um, they're, they're, they're here. And immediately, as soon as they land, they meet the afflicted. They meet the afflicted, and the afflicted is a very compelling uh, person inside of this story because the afflicted was beyond the help of man. The afflicted, uh, mankind had done all they could to this man filled with these demons, these, these demons called legion, and they, they tried to reason with him. They tried to bind him, chain him. Uh, they, they had tried to really lock him down to, to, to protect him from hurting anyone else or even himself, but they were ineffective. So the only thing they could do was exile him. They exiled him to the tombs. Now, here's a very interesting place, these tombs. They were, they were actually uh, caves that were on, on the sea cliffs. And these hollowed out caves is where when somebody died, the people from the village or the surrounding area would take their body, wrap it, and put it inside of these tombs, inside of these caves. Now, you need to think about what happens when, when the sea air, the wind from the sea is blowing inland? About half a mile inland is the town of Gadara. And the smell of death would be washing over that town every day from the first day that a body went into those tombs. It makes me wonder if, there, if the stench of death, the stench of sin is around me long enough Will I eventually no longer smell it? These people were in a position where the stench of death was around them, but eventually, may, there's a commercial on these days that says, uh, you know, have you gone nose blind? And, and, and I wonder if, if those people from that area, area had gone nose blind. And this was the place where they exiled, they exiled the, the demoniac. They couldn't do anything with him. I don't know how many relationships he had destroyed. I don't know how much property he had destroyed. I don't know how many people he had hurt or wounded, maybe even killed. I don't, you know, he's consumed by this evil and he, and he gets exiled to where these tombs are. And the Bible says that day and night, he cried out, he cried out, he cried out day and night. Well, that sea air that's blowing in makes me wonder if it not only carried the stench of death, but it carried in the cries of the afflicted. Just day after day, night after night, as they're trying to go to sleep, the howls and the cries of the afflicted. And, and, and I wonder how easy it would be to become numb to hearing that day after day after day that you no longer hear it. Have you ever stayed in a place, maybe a, with a relative or a friend, and maybe they have a fan that's got a click? Uh, here at, at, at our home, one of the things after my daughter had moved out, she came back home and we had placed a a clock upstairs and the clock when they when the tv is on you can't hear it or if you've lived here you can't hear it but for somebody who's visiting you hear that tick 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 i don't hear it anymore but anyone who visits my home it's ringing loud and clear i wonder i wonder if they just no longer heard him so back to the afflicted it makes me wonder also as he's crying out if there was just a moment of lucidity if there was just a moment of clarity in his mind that maybe he said, oh, God, help me. We know that Jesus has a heart for the afflicted. 
We know that even from the thief on the cross, he can do something with simply a single word being uttered. And so it makes me wonder, did this demoniac just in some moment of torment between the gouges and the, and the, and, and the pains, if he would just say, oh God, can you help me? And, I, and it makes me wonder if that prayer may have just kind of arced over the Sea of Galilee and landed where Jesus was having church, having good church with the hearers. And it stops him and it gets him moving on his way. And, and, he, and, he, and he gets there and I've got a killer attack dog. So y'all, y'all, y'all try to ignore my miniature pincher. Um, but uh, it makes me wonder if Jesus, who's teaching the hearers, suddenly is, is, is moved by the need of the afflicted. And, and so then we pick up the story and we see that Jesus, uh, Jesus casts the, these demons, these 2,000 demons into this, into this uh, herd of swine, into all these pigs. And they go running into the sea and they all die. And, and uh, so somebody runs into town and is like, oh, my gosh, you know, the pigs are dead. So they come running out and they see what Jesus has done. And, it, and the Bible points out they see the demoniac, the man that they could not help that was beyond their help. They see him sitting in his right mind. All of the work that they, they couldn't accomplish in him, all of the help, all the effort that they put into it, here he is sitting in his right mind after a simple encounter with Jesus. And suddenly they're very afraid of Jesus. They're also kind of hacked off that he killed their pigs. So they, they just beg him to leave. Man, would you just leave? Would you, would you just go? And, and then something very curious happens. Um, the, uh, the demoniac goes up to Jesus. And as Jesus is getting in the boat to leave, and he says, um, Hey, Jesus, can I, can I go with you? Man, don't we know what it feels like to be delivered? Here's this demoniac that no one could help. But in a moment, Jesus releases him from his torment and he heals him. And now he's in his right mind and, and he felt the power of Jesus. He felt the power of the Redeemer. He felt that power. And it seems like a very righteous ask. Look, man. I don't know how many relationships this demoniac had destroyed when he wasn't in his right mind. I don't know how much property damage he caused or how much damage to cattle and livestock he caused when he wasn't in his right mind. I don't know. I don't know how many people he abused and hurt and used. I don't know how much debt he had incurred. I don't, I don't know what all he had done to the people of that region, but he, he wasn't in his right mind. Now he's back in his right mind and he has to deal with the consequence of when he wasn't in his right mind. So it seemed like a very natural ask to say, hey, there's nothing left here for me. There's nothing remaining in this place for me. So Jesus, can I just, can I just go with me? I, I want to keep feeling this power. Can I, just, can I just go with you? And Jesus almost surprisingly says, no, no, you can't. You can't go with me. Instead, I want you to go back to your family. I want you to go back to the village, your friends, and I want you to tell them. I want you to tell them what I've done for you here. I want, I'm sending you back with the testimony and with the mission. You have been healed. You have been restored. You are no longer the afflicted. So the man then departs from Jesus, and he has to go back in and face the music for all the things that he did, but also bring a testimony with him about what God has done for him and to be a witness, witness of Jesus Christ. So let's... in. Real quickly, I want to kind of review these characters. I want to review these groups of people. You've got the hearers. You know, watch how impressed you are with a crowd. That's what I would say to you. There always needs to be somebody serving the crowd, serving the people. Um, and Jesus, his teachings are embraced by so many different, a wide variety of people. So it doesn't necessarily mean their lives are all being transformed. It doesn't mean their lives are all being saved. It means they're enjoying the teaching of Jesus. So you, as a doer, somebody who is involved in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ, needs to figure out how to get that gospel message to the people that are listening to it in a way they can most relevantly understand. Be a, a person who, who does the help. If, if you're not the person back behind the pulpit, your ministry is whatever is going to be required to get that gospel message into everybody who's attending. So if somebody's hungry, feed them. It's awful hard to, to, to embrace and learn from the teachings of Jesus on an empty stomach. If, if, if people are cold, warm them up, give them a blanket. 
If people in your community have a need, meet the need, be the doer so that people can most relevantly receive the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And if you do have a microphone, if you do have a platform, if you do have an opportunity to share, you need to love your audience more than your content. You need to love the people more than what you're going to tell them. Jesus did. You need to love the people more than what you're going to tell them. If you love your audience more than your content, then you'll know your audience. You'll learn your audience. You'll learn how they receive knowledge and what's important to them. You'll learn what they value. And when you learn what they value, then you can most relevantly present the gospel in a way they can understand. So you're either presenting the gospel or you're doing something to ensure the gospel is well presented. Then think about the journey. If you're going in the direction Jesus has told you to go at the time he's told you to go, you need to expect a storm. You need to expect a storm to come in your life. Oh, but Jesus is with me. Yes, he is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But you can encounter a storm that's bigger than you are. And unless you've engaged Jesus, it's going to feel like it, it, it can take your life. It can, it can ruin your ministry. It can destroy everything about you if you haven't engaged Jesus. So if you're expecting a storm and when the storm comes, how are you going to engage Jesus? Doers need to know how to engage Jesus. One of the things that I, I share with people often, um, when people, when, particularly with doers, people involved in ministry, when they do encounter a storm, how can they pray? How can they, how can they engage Jesus in their storm? Let me give you another scripture. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 6 through 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 6 through 12. That recounts the prayer of a great king of Judah named Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, um, in his prayer, uh, he does four things. You see, he's just been made aware that his entire kingdom is about to be overrun by three armies. There's three groups of people that are coming to destroy him, his army, his people. He's, they're about to be obliterated. And he's powerless in the face of this enemy. He, it, this, this requires more of him than there is of him. So, in his prayer, he's got everybody assembled together, and he does four things in his prayer. The first thing that he does is he reminds God of who God is. I think anytime you encounter a storm, you need to remember, who is God to you? Who is he to you? Do you know the names of God found in scripture? Who has God revealed himself to be to you? The second thing he did was he reminded God of the promises God had made for his people. Do you know the promises of God? For his believers? Do you know the promises of God for the children of God? Do you know them? Can you recite them? Why? Has God forgotten them? No, God hasn't forgotten them. It's just important that you remember them. It's awful hard for me to call down a promise that I don't even know about. How can I cash in on a promise of God if I don't even know the promises available to me? So how am I going to engage Jesus in my storm? I, I remind him of who he is to me. I remind him of the promises he has made to me. The third thing I do is I clearly state the problem by name. Here's a challenge for you. Don't, and, and this is going to be controversial. Pastor Landon may have to correct me on this. I am not the guy to come to with an unspoken prayer request. Because how do I know what I'm agreeing with? If somebody comes to me, it's like, oh, Pastor, I've got an unspoken prayer request. Will you agree with me? No, I won't. Tell me what you want me to agree with you about. So we can put a bullseye on it. If you have some strange tropical disease, teach me how to say it and tell me what it does so I can put a bullseye on it so I can clearly state the name of the problem. And that's what King Jehoshaphat does. He calls out the armies that are, that are threatening him by name. And then the fourth thing he did was he completely turned it over to God. He said, we are powerless in the face of this mighty enemy. So he submitted the problem to God. So those are the four things. If you want to engage Jesus in your storm, remind him who, be, who he is to you. Remind him of the promises that he's made for you and your family, your life as a believer. Clearly state the problem by name and then turn it over to him completely. And then, and then keep on the journey. Keep going in the direction he's told you to go and trust him for the answer. When you encounter the afflicted, what do you do when you encounter the afflicted? You see, Jesus could have just snapped his finger on one side of the sea and appeared on the other side of the sea. But that's not what he did. He chose doers to take him. So are you taking Jesus to the affliction? Are you taking him to the need? Are you the vehicle Jesus is using to get to the need? If you're never encountering a storm and there's no affliction anywhere near you, then I wonder, I wonder, 
Are you really a doer? Are you taking Jesus to where he, he needs to go? And then expect Jesus to be the deliverer. It's not on you. You're not the deliverer. You're not. You're about as powerless as the people in, inside of uh, the Gerizines. You can do what you can do, but without God, man, there's just forces in this world that are bigger and better and stronger than you are. It's going to take Jesus. Your job is to get Jesus there, present him to the affliction, and let the affliction be humbled by his power. Last thing I want to share with you um, is something that, uh, it was a cool thing when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I played every sport you could possibly imagine to play, and I loved baseball, anything that I, I, I loved all that. I like, and I had to do chores around the house. I had to mow the yard, cut firewood, do all that. So we had like no electrical tools whatsoever. And I developed calluses on my hand. And like a cool thing, I thought it was like a cool thing. I would take a needle and I would run it through the callus on my hand. So I'd have a needle sticking through a callus sideways on my hand. And I could close and open my hand and the needle would be stuck in the callus all the way through it. And my, uh, and, and, and so uh, like, it'd be like the cool thing thinking that, you know, my friends might find that cool or, um, you know, something. And, but really all a callus is, it, a callus is, is protection over an area that should be sensitive. This, this pad on my finger should be sensitive. If I, if I grab something that's too hot and I don't need to hold it, and I have a callus there, I might not recognize it until I do further damage. But if it's sensitive, I'm gonna pull my hand back quickly. As a, as a doer, make sure that you don't develop a callus over your heart to the affliction, to the stench of sin and death, Make sure that you're sensitive. The people of, of the town had developed a callus over their heart. They couldn't treat this man, so they simply exiled him. And the smell of stench, the stench of death and, 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 and agony and persecution was coming across them every single day. And eventually, you go nose blind to it, you go ear blind to it. You know, we're, we're in a society today around the world where the stench of sin and death and agony and persecutions around us. Are you still sensitive to it? Are you still sensitive to the afflicted? Because that's who Jesus has come for, the afflicted, those who need a savior. That's who he came for. And you're the vehicle, you're the doer that gets him to that place. So inside of this Mark 4 and 5, Think of it as a moment. It's a moment. It's a moment where God interacted with mankind and gave us a beautiful lesson of four different character types. There are the hearers that come in masses, may not be changed, but they're going to come and listen. They're very interested. There are the doers, always going to be few doers than hearers, always going to be few do fewer doers. I'm a poet and didn't realize it, fewer doers. Um, there's always going to be less of them. So be a doer, do something. Um, get Jesus to the need. And as you're doing it, expect a storm and engage him in the storm. And I gave you a formula on how you can engage him in the storm. Look for the afflicted. And when you find him, introduce him to Jesus and caution your heart, protect your heart that you don't develop a callus where God intended there to be a sensitive space. Don't grow numb to the stench of sin and death and the cries of the afflicted. Keep your heart sensitive. So, Pastor Landon, that's what I wanted to share. You, you asked me about sharing about calling. I hope that was relevant. I hope somebody got something out of it. So, so good, Pastor Mike. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, we have, if you have questions, go ahead and start getting those in. We've already got one question in that we'll tackle. But uh, maybe while we're getting them in, I'd I love to um, get a little clarity and insight. So, uh, that last point about remaining sensitive. Uh, I think for a lot of developing and emerging leaders, it's so hard to find that balance or that line uh, between not making every problem your problem, you know, where, where you're not in a constant state of, because the need's always present, the need's always there. So if you let everyone's need disrupt your personal peace, uh, then you're going to be robbing your family and you're robbing yourself of, of you know, of joy and, and peace, right? Right. So how do we... How do we keep that sensitivity to the needs around us while it's still creating a, a space where we can, where everyone's need doesn't infringe upon our personal uh, sense of peace and joy? You know, one of the things I love about God is that he takes broken vessels and he uses them to give, you know, 
the life-giving waters of, of eternity through Jesus Christ. You know, so what am I doing to remain a vessel intact? If he's restored me, if he's taken a cracked or broken vessel and he's restored me, am I, am I maintaining the integrity of my restoration? And a lot of that has to do with my spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical health. Um, am, I, am I trying to out Jesus Jesus? Am I trying to do more Jesus work than Jesus does? You know, again, the responsibilities of the doers are really focused on uh, getting Jesus to the need. At the end of the day, I'm not Jesus. And I think one of the things, you know, in the world, they would call it Superman syndrome. But I think in the church, we, we don't say it, but we try to be Jesus Christ syndrome. Right. We try to, we try to out Jesus, Jesus. And, um, you know, I think it begins with saying, you know, at the end of the day, the doers who were with Jesus had to sleep and they had to eat. They had to be prepared. Uh, they had to be healthy and strong to get Jesus where he wanted to go. So if I'm now compromised, if I'm not able to get Jesus to the afflicted, if I'm not able to get Jesus to where Jesus is calling me to take him, then something's out of whack and out of balance in my life. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm not looking forward to ministry every week, if I'm begrudgingly going into the church offices, if I'm, if I'm not looking for, if I'm not feeling the freshness of inspiration, if I'm, if I'm in a, in a place where I'm not motivated and inspired for the good news of Jesus Christ, then something I have done in my life is typically out of whack because God will give you the grace on anything he's placed upon you. He says, take my yoke. It's light. His, lo his yoke's not going to tie you down. It's, it's the yokes that you put on top of it. Right. That's great. So, the, so being a doer isn't really doing the work. It's doing the work of bringing people to Jesus so that he can right. save you. And if we realize that, realize that it's not our, you know, we don't save anybody. We don't heal anybody. We don't bless anybody. We, we become vehicles where those things can happen. Uh, yeah. So good. So a uh, couple of questions that are starting to come in. Uh, your uh, surprisingly enough, your comment about don't come to me with a unspoken prayer request uh, listed a question. Um, okay. <laughs> so how do you discern who to trust with targeted prayer? Uh, obviously, prayer requests can turn into gossip. So how do you, if, if you're going to you know, make your, and I completely agree with you, that, that the unspoken prayer request, um, we have to agree with one another in faith. And if I don't know what you're if I, if I don't know what we're praying about, it's hard for me to really agree with you because I don't know if it's something I can agree with or not, you know? Uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm not going to agree with you to get a new spouse. Like I'm going to agree with you to like, like for your marriage to be healed. Right. So, um, so how did we know who we can talk to and who we, and who we, uh, who we can't with those targeted prayer requests? Well, I, you know, to me, I, and I may not be fully understanding the question, but I mean, you know, in my world, um, if somebody comes to me with a, they're, they're asking for my agreement in prayer concerning a need. Well, who's that need for? And what does this prayer benefit? What's, is this prayer um, that, that's being brought to me for agreement in? Um, if, you, if you're simply trying to inform me about uh, negative behavior from somebody else inside of the church, that doesn't require a whole lot of discernment. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's a we may need to do a one-off counseling session about you know about the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish what we're trying to do through through um, agreement in faith and in prayer you know prayer to me is uh, holy communication unto God and I'm and we're trying to get in one accord we're trying to find agreement amongst ourselves and bring that um, to Jesus we're trying to bring that to our intercessor and so if there's not an an actionable item attached to the prayer if it's not a prayer of thanksgiving or a prayer that's going to move the kingdom of God forward in somebody's life, it's simply a matter of, of uh, gossip, then, um, you know, there's, there's other things, there's other venues for those types of discussions that probably need to be addressed, but that's not really found in prayer. I mean, I'm constantly looking for, you know, what is the thing we can agree upon? Um, and if somebody's as trivial as to bring something like gossip to the table, right. I'm probably not the most patient guy with that. So, you know, we can, we can have a you know a little wall-to-wall -wall counseling if we need to um yeah and and i think we all have to find out uh when it comes to our own our own prayer needs who we can trust with that and that's oh, yeah. of like so um so if i don't want to give all the details i could come to pastor mike and say hey i'm struggling with my attitude can you help me with that 
but there might be someone else in my life that I can go into some more detail on like what exactly it is about my attitude. I mean, this doesn't apply to me whatsoever. My attitude is always a hundred percent good. Uh, but other people sometimes attitude have attitude problems. Well, and yeah, when you flip it that way, if it's if it's me who I'm going to go find in agreement and I'm going to share my prayers with, then I'm going to take my deepest need upline. So, what mentors do I have in my life? Who's pastoring me? Who can tell me no? Who really is concerned about my life? Right. Um, and the walk that I have, and I will take it there. Um, if it's my sideline, somebody that's a peer to me. Um, then I will look for mutual agreement, mutual walk, something that that I'm not necessarily looking for guidance and direction from that individual. I, I really want my brother just to join with me and strengthen in faith and let's let's do this. And if it's my downline, then I'm going to be, if I go to them and say, hey, agree with me in prayer, then it's dealing typically with corporate blessing. It's something that's going to benefit their life. It's going to benefit my life. Um, but I'm probably not going to dump my deepest, darkest things on people that I, that are looking to me for leadership. You know, so if it's my, my greatest challenges, I look up just like I'm looking up to Jesus. I look up to somebody who's pastoring or leading me, somebody who, who can also, in addition to praying for me, counsel me, give me correction, direction, who can tell me no, you know, kind of that way, you know, and that, that, that's how in very, very brief terms, how I break it down. All right, so a couple more questions here. Great answer. Uh, so um, if you are a doer, um, I guess the question that I'm trying to rephrase it here is, is how do you discern what needs to be done? Uh, or should you be wait to be led by the spirit? So how much of this is your initiative? How much of this is God's initiative? Oh, I think, uh, I think um, almost 100% of it is your initiative. God, God's going to steer you. I think God's much more interested in steering you than kickstarting you. I got on at Grace Church um, 17, over 17 years ago. Uh, why is that? Because my wife and I got there and I immediately started looking around to see what needed to be done. I am, I'm a former special operations soldier in the United States Army. I'm a combat veteran. Guess what my first assignment at Grace Church was? Children's ministry. <laughs> why? Because they didn't, any help, they didn't need any help preaching. They didn't need any help with worship, and I would be no help there. They didn't need any help with production or with youth ministry, but, man, they needed some help in kids' ministry. And so my wife and I are like, well, where do they need help? Let's let's just jump in. And we started working in kids' ministry, and six months later, Pastor Brett Jones called me and was like, hey, would you and your wife consider leading our kids' ministry? Man, I didn't. God didn't appear to me in some vision and say, hey, I want you to get involved in kids' ministry. No, that's where... Being a doer, I'm looking around to say what needed to be done. Somebody that day at the Sea of Galilee looks at Jesus and he's teaching and they realize the people on the end can't hear him. Right. So somebody went and got a boat and brought it over and said, hey, this is what needs to be done right now. I don't think Jesus had to appear to them in a vision and, you know, guide them and direct them and give them this unction. They looked around and they saw this is what needs to be done to get the gospel to more people. That's what needs to be done. I'm capable. I'll go make that happen. So I'm much, you know, I travel around the world. I work with mission partners all over the world, and I'm always looking to see what they're doing. What are you doing? If you're, if you're sitting and waiting for divine instruction, I'm not saying there's not a time or a place for that, but that's typically not every day. I, I see more people doing more things for the kingdom and, and being elevated in the kingdom in great ways when they simply start doing it. And I think what this could easily do, too, for those of you who have someone who reports to you, to your department leader, is to give people the freedom to do. Like, it's much easier. Uh, it's much easier to take someone who might be a little overambitious and steer them than someone who is underambitious and prod them. So, like, if someone's working at, you know, uh, Pastor Mike and I are great together. So if someone's at my campus at Tomball, I would really much rather have someone who's like, more of a threat to overstep that I can always that I that I could like pull back on than someone where I'm gonna go, hey, can you do this? I mean, could could you go pick up that piece of paper? Could you do you mind going and having that conversation? Do you, do you mind leaving that like I um so I think we have to really empower people in our ministries to be doers as well. To let them know yeah. like, hey, you you get busy and we'll steer you. But, but yeah, you I, I, I <laughs> I think you're right on. One of the things I share with some of our young leaders, um, there's, you know, in the world of ministry, there's two types of horses. There's show ponies and plow horses. Right. And young in ministry, 
man, I wanted to be a show pony. Yeah. You need to hear me preach. You need to see me do. You need to, you know, and it's about look at me, look at me, look at me. But the plow horse is the one that gets all the work done. Right. And, and, and when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, Texas, all the plow horses got the work done. Right. And it was tough to find a show pony on those days where we were out at 4 a.m., you know, getting people out of their home, uh, unless there was a video camera. Now, if there was a video camera, oftentimes, you know, show ponies, are, they'll show up around them. But, man, it's the plow horses uh, that, that get the work of the ministry done. And, and I'm telling you, if, if your church, if your ministry is filled with plow horses, you're going to move the kingdom of God. That's what plow horses do. I saw there was a Belgian um, draft horse, and they put 12 strongmen contestants uh, pulling a rope, and they had a tug of war between one Belgian uh, draft horse and 12 strongmen, world's strongest man athletes, to see who could win this tug of war. It was absolutely no contest. The Belgian draft horse drugged those 12 guys as far as he wanted to because there's power behind a plow horse. Beautiful. So I think sometimes we can be, we can really be a lid on our ministries whenever we don't empower people to be doers. We say we want them to be doers. But then there's something as well, you need my permission first, or you need to make sure you're doing it the right way. And and being a bold enough leader to say, yeah, just just do it. And um, so for those of you who are making your way in ministry, uh, your your uh, directors, pastors are going to notice your ability to do. Um, however, uh, if you're already leading a department, I encourage you to to em empower those those people. Um, and another question, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, if, so the person that asked, you can, you can clarify if I, don't, if I don't catch the gist right. But Jesus knew the perfect place to send the restored for the best purpose. How do we know where to guide the restored? So I would, I would think maybe for the demoniac, for his next step was to stay where he was. How do we know maybe how to direct people to once they've been restored, once they've been healed, once they've been helped by Jesus, how do we know what their next step might be? Well, you know, one of the great stories that I love in ministry uh, is a gentleman by the name of Reza. And Reza was, uh, is an Iranian. And uh, his good friend was the president of the Iranian Bible Society up until the Islamic Revolution of 1979. And about a year or two before the Islamic Revolution, Reza gave his life to Jesus. And when Reza gave his life to Jesus, uh, the man who led him in this journey, which was years long, he had to step away from a belief. And Reza was a very successful businessman uh, in Iran in the 1970s, late 60s, early 70s. And when he, when he gave his life to Jesus, Brother Sam looked at him and was like, you did it. You gave your life to Jesus. And Reza said, yes, I gave my life to Jesus today. He said, you did it today? Yes. I said, great. Go get in the car. I said, get in the car. Uh, okay. Maybe we're going to go get something to eat or drink. They go get in the car and they travel to a house of a non-believer. And when they get to the house, Brother Sam walks in with Reza and says, brother, this is my friend Reza. He gave his life to Jesus Christ today. Reza, tell him why you did it. And in that moment, Reza is giving a testimony of why he gave his life to Jesus Christ to a non-believer. He was instantly deployed to tell his story. He was instantly deployed to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the afflicted, to somebody who needed to hear the story. So if you're trying to find a place where you should send somebody, think of where Jesus would send somebody. Where is the place where they can tell their story, where they can develop their story, where they can participate in ministry um, without, you know, I, for some reason, we decided that you can't Im involve yourself in, in, in any form of ministry unless somebody licenses you or somebody gives you some type of authority to do so. The only person that gave the demoniac any authority was Jesus Christ. And he sent him back to the place he probably didn't want to go, right? Um, you know, to do it. But but that's where he was equipped. He would be the one to tell the story there. There's some of the people you lead can tell the story of Jesus Christ in environments you'll never be able to. Right. So good. So uh, if there's any more questions, you, you get them in. I want to circle back to something towards the beginning of what you said that, that I think we both share a mutual passion. 
and that is communicating to an audience, uh, not content, but to the people. I, I heard Andy Stanley say once that uh, he doesn't teach lessons or he doesn't preach sermons. He preaches sermons to people. Uh, so he's re- it, it's people that he's preaching to, people that he's teaching. The content isn't his main focus. It's all about the audience. So what are some tips there where we can really keep our audience um uh, to the forefront. So, so those hearers that are coming, how do we engage them? Uh, how do we make sure that we're, we're keeping their needs to the forefront rather than our content or our agenda? Well, I think there's three things, three key things that it goes all the way back to the Greeks. Um, you know, there's, there's what credibility do you have with the audience? Why should they listen to you? Why should they listen to you? Uh, if, if, if I'm speaking to a group of people, I need to be considerate of why that group of people should listen to me? Who has endorsed me to be there? Why did they come? What are they expecting to hear? Why am I qualified to speak to them on whatever subject matter that I'm going to be speaking to them? That's that's our ethos. That's our ethos. That's, that's our credibility to an audience. So I think figuring out before you ever start talking to them what they're expecting to hear and what qualifies you to speak to them is very, very important. The next thing I think you need to do is find a way to emotionally relate to them. How do you how do you emotionally make a connection with them? What's important to them? What do they value? If there's something that they value, how can you intelligently communicate about something of pertinent experience that taps into what they value? If if they recognize you and give you credibility as a communicator and they see that you are interested in what they are interested in, that you value what they value, you've got a personal illustration that demonstrates that, I think that's a that's a great way to to build your pathos, your your emotional connection with them. And then ultimately you need to have command of your subject matter. You need to own what you're preaching about. It needs to mean something to you because it, it, the worst thing you can do is take an incredible sermon that that Pastor Landon has written and then try to preach it off his notes. Well, that's not yours. It's not your material. And you're going to lose your ethos really, really quick with the people. Um, I'm reminded of a young pastor whose friend was a youth pastor. He'd recently been saved and then he's fast tracked through serving and a church really wanted him to lead the youth. And he's a good communicator, but he had very little background in faith. And so he's invited to speak at a Wednesday night in big church. And uh, so he gets up to speak and he says, you know, I th- I'm so thankful for this opportunity. If you would just turn your Bible to the book of Psalms, Psalms, <laughs> and everybody kind of chuckled at first thinking he was making a joke. But then throughout his sermon, he kept saying Psalms, Psalms, Psalms. And what started out as a joke led to him losing credibility with the people because he didn't own his material. He, he was taking a, a simple mistake. But it, it demonstrated a lack of depth of understanding and study. So those are the three things. I think in knowing your audience, um, you know, the first two things are totally audience related. How do you develop credibility with the group of people you're speaking to? What qualifies you to talk to them? The second thing is how do you connect with them? How do you build an emotional connection, knowing what they value, knowing what's important to them? And how do you demonstrate that that's important to you, too? And then ultimately, how much command of your material do you have? And if you can do those three things, I think you can communicate to just about any audience in the world. Great. Great. All right, here's another one for you, Pastor Mike. Um, after you've identified the show ponies and the plow horses, uh, how do we lead the ponies to become horses? So well, I think you, you, the you give them. At some point, because uh, it's biologically not possible, but in the kingdom it is. Right? Well, I think in the kingdom, I think in the kingdom, you, you know, you, you put them, you, you hook them up to the plow. Mm-hmm. And there's some that, you know, when they get into ministry, a lot of it deals with motive. They, you know, there's a, there's a man that a uh, young man, I think he was 18 or 19 years old. And he sees John Maxwell speaking and he's at this event. And John Maxwell speaks to a crowd of like 3,500 people. And after it's over with John Maxwell's out signing books and he's, you know, just signing book after book, after book, after book. And this young man's watching. And eventually he walks over to John Maxwell and he says, you know, I've decided. I want to do what you do, come to a place like this, speak to thousands of people, and then come out here and sell all your books and then write a little note and take pictures with people. I want to do that. And John Maxwell looked at him and says, you want to do what I do? Well, you need to first did what I did. Mm -hmm. And so I think 
the idea there is take somebody and give them an opportunity to pull the plow. And that goes back to your point earlier, Pastor Landon, is if you, you can't micromanage in the kingdom, there's not enough time to micromanage in the kingdom. If somebody's heart is right, give them an opportunity to put in the work. And if they put in the work, they, they will develop strength in areas maybe they didn't even know they had. They may aspire to be this show pony, but you got to pull the plow first. Yeah. And two, you can, um, like, like what you reward, you, you can go on and support. So if you, if you reward show pony behavior, so if there's someone who's gifted on your team, they're not a hard worker, but they're gifted, yet they keep getting opportunity, then what you're teaching the people is that it's okay to not have a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. So you really can do that by promoting the plow horse. Uh, and if a, if a position comes available to step up to new level of leadership, take the plow horse over the show pony. So, so take the person who's willing to work hard over the one who has the inherent gifts that isn't working hard. Because what you'll do if you keep promoting the show ponies, you'll create a show pony culture. And Absolutely. We'll, and then you'll get plow. And there's nothing worse than a plow horse that thinks he's a show pony. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. We've all known people like that, right? That just, that, that what made them them was that grit, that determination. But then something happened where they, where they, where they switched and became a little more egotistical. And it's like, okay, well, a show pony is bad enough, but a plow horse being a show pony is, is even worse. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think you, I think it's not only promoting, but just simply celebrating it, celebrating that you value the plow horses, that, that you value that kids ministry worker that's been back there for eight or nine years, changing diapers every single week that that's valuable, that that's important, that there's a special place, that God's going to do great things in their life because they're serving the kingdom of God as a doer inside of an environment that there's no show ponies in that environment. There's no, if somebody's been working in a nursery for eight years, I can guarantee you that is not a show pony. That is a plow horse. And man, I promise you this, inside of a church culture, inside of a ministry, there's a lot more room for plow horses than there are show ponies. Yeah, and, and as a general rule, the show ponies don't last long because ministry may look prestigious and glamorous from a distance, but if you're in it long enough, you realize that like it's really not all that glamorous, no matter how people make it look. So if you're in it for the wrong reason, then you're going to be uh, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it very long. There's very so show ponies typically don't don't do ministry very long. Yeah or at least my, my perception there. No, I totally agree with you. And, and again, that doesn't mean there's not redemption for somebody that comes in and says, hey, look, I, everything I've seen in ministry values this culture of the show pony. Right. Well, just because you've seen that doesn't necessarily make that the most sustainable model for ministry. Right. Um, time and again, it's proven. You know, it's, it's the work you're going to put in. You know, the, I think people fall in love with the idea. I'm going to go plant a church. Are you now? <laughs> All right, plow horse. <laughs> you're gonna be hitching up to the plow right well this has been so good tonight pastor mike thank you for your time and uh i know we could we could have these conversations all night I, actually i want to get you back on and go deeper into the ethos pathos log of stuff it's uh i've oh, heard yeah. you several times and you're it's just a fantastic you, you do a fantastic job of, ex of explaining that and uh you are a prime example of a of a communicator who uses all three with a very strong pathos and I'll always enjoy hearing you communicate. So thank you uh, for being with us tonight. I loved it. Great, great stuff. And again, you made the right choice being a part of destiny. Uh, you've made the right choice in ministry and, and I'm sure going through this programming, you realize this is a plow horse program. This is not a show pony program. <laughs> oh, well, we don't need too many amens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Pastor Mike, thank you so much for the, Absolutely. why don't you just uh, pray a blessing over our students and then we will call it a night. Love to. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for those that you've called according to your purpose. Father, I think that that calling is something that for many people it's remained a mystery because they, they keep waiting for some ethereal experience. But God, I see it time and again, the value that you place upon those that are simply willing to do for your kingdom. So may we always keep that that simple heart, just that heart to do for the kingdom of God. Father, I pray that you would do as your word says in Deuteronomy 31.8, that the Lord himself goes before his people 
means I don't have to depend on an ambassador or an emissary to go before me, but you yourself will go before me into the works of my hand, into the relationships that I have in my life, my money, my health. God, go before me in all those things and go before those that are on this call that are working so hard. They're working so hard, God, to build your kingdom. So, Father, utilize their skills, their gifts, their talents. And, Father, help them do as their heart desires to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all for attending. It's been a great night. We'll see you on the next one.